the second half of today, uh, today's uh, presentation is, it's, it's one of my favorite um, presentations to give because it, for me, it's, it's, it's what's at the kind of at the heart of, of what church life is, is about. Um, we spend a lot of time uh, in ecclesiastical, uh, obviously thinking about the structure, the bricks and mortar of the, of the churches and the cathedrals and the minsters and the castles and stately homes that we ensure. Um, but actually inside that shell is a living, breathing community. Um, and, and that's what this is about. What we term open churches uh, are the ones that are open during the day um, and uh, without necessarily anybody having to be there, uh, but they're there just for people to be able to come and to pray and to be quiet, to look at the architecture, look at the history, um, just spend some time where the phone, your phone may not work because the walls are too thick um, and you're just there. And we don't get much time like that these days, do we? So we're offering this little haven of peace, but also that, that so that's on a, a level, that, that's what might draw people in or the, their family history or the history of the building or the people that used to worship there. But when they're inside, it gives you then an opportunity to share the reason for the building being there and share faith and share the, the good news about the Christian message. So that's what this is about. So let's fire up the slides, please, Pam. And um, we'll start going through this. Um, <clears throat> now, the, the interesting thing is, if you want to go, yeah, bounce through those, it's not the 128th of June either. Must have been very bleary eyed. Keep going because we've done all this bit. Um, okay, so that's fine. So, whenever we talk about this, people say, yeah, but you're an insurance company. Surely you want us to keep it as safe and secure and as tightly locked up as possible. Um, and we say, no, that's not necessarily the case. So we're going to look at, at these four myths, these four things that people initially, when we start talking to them about opening up your church, these are the four things that mo most people come back to us with. Ah, yeah, but what, what about this? So well, we're not insured if we leave your church open. Everything's got to be locked away. Someone's going to be on the premises while the doors are open. Well, aren't we asking for trouble if we leave, if we leave it open? So we're going to go through this uh, for the next sort of half an hour or so. And, um, and, and just to sort of see, look, how do we do it? Now, first of all, how, uh, just a show of hands, um, how many people... Uh, their church uh, is the, is open during the day. How many people open the doors during the day? Some of them. So Some you of them. Okay. I can, see, <laughs> I can see, Joe, I can see the way that the screen is. All I can see is the top of your head and a hand. It looks quite dramatic. <laughs> so, that, so that's fine. So, so yeah, so some people, that, that's, that's fairly normal. I mean, you're, most of you are doing it. Um, uh, and, 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 it's becoming more common. Um, sometimes, as you can imagine, it can be a bit of a battle. Um, and we'll talk a bit about that in a minute. So I'll come to the next slide, please. So why bother? We've talked a bit about this already. So provides an opportunity for mission and ministry, opens the doors, gets people inside. Um, some people never go to church. Some people may go to a wedding or a funeral. Um, but for most people, church isn't part of their lives anymore. Um, this is an opportunity to open the doors and start to demystify a little bit about what church is like. Even if it's just, what, what does it look like in there? What's that? What does that do? I was on the phone to my sister. My sister is, uh, um, lives down in, in Winchester, and uh, she was her, her and her husband were looking after one of their grandchildren. Um, that, um, and they went down... To, down somewhere on the south coast and they they walked down to the to the to the harbour and there was a little church there and, and the door was open um and uh their granddaughter darcy um uh hadn't 
I, th I don't think maybe had not been inside a church building, certainly not a parish church building like that before. Um, and so they went in just to have a look around. Uh, and the thing she was fascinated by was the font. She really couldn't understand. And, and my sister was explaining what, you know, what baptism was and what, it, what all that meant. And, and uh, she was fascinated by that. Um, so by opening the doors, it gives people an opportunity to ask those questions. The other thing it does is it can, in, in, strangely, by opening the doors, it has a positive effect on security. With churches now, you know that actually there's not a lot of stealable stuff in them anymore. Um, and therefore, people will break in thinking that there's going to be all sorts of jewel encrusted chalices on the altar and things like that. We know that's not the case, but they've still broken in. And actually, for most theft-related break-in kind of claims, as it says on the uh, on the last point on that slide, um, most of the cost of that is someone jemmying open the door or breaking through a stained glass window. Um, and as you know, replacing those things is not cheap. Uh, and so by opening the doors, it gives people an opportunity to go in, have a look around, thinking, oh, there's nothing to steal here. And then they'll go away. Um, so it's kind of counterintuitive. But hopefully that's the, that's, that's the way it works. Um, so next slide, please. So some of the guiding principles of how to open the, the door safely. And we realise that it's not a one size fits all. OK, there's going to be situations and maybe even within the experience of this small group here tonight that um, some people say, well, we, 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 we open we have the doors open every Saturday um, and they do that because there's people around so there's people cleaning the church ready for Sunday there's people doing the flowers there's the choir practicing whatever it is there, there are people around the building so they open the doors and people can go in and they can they can chat um so you you get that you get that situation you also get the situation where because of where you are you open the doors and and people just go in and, and in and out as, as they please and that again that's that's absolutely fine with us um but it does, having the doors open, it, it just it sort of encourages encourages people to go in. Um, and then sometimes by also having other things going on, like I say, people doing maintenance, people doing the, uh, doing the flowers, um, uh, choir practices, that sort of thing, people can wander in and there's somebody there to talk. Some of the churches that we insure, especially in sort of market towns and things like that, they'll open on market day and they'll just have, you know, maybe a, a tea and coffee table there a couple of, of the parishioners there volunteering just to welcome people talk a little bit about the history of the building um, just have a chat people go in for lots of different reasons um, maybe they just want to talk to somebody maybe they don't know that they want to talk to somebody but they go in and find that they are talking to someone who has got a listening ear and then, who knows nothing about their circumstance and sometimes like we said before people just want to sit in the quiet so there is when it comes to opening the church there is this focus on protection with flexibility so it's about being sensible it's a balancing between the risk and 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 security and and flexibility and also accessibility it's getting that that sort of that that balance right between all those things we do get asked a lot about time locks um we do recommend that people uh, if they can lock up at the end of the day Again, it's not a one size fits all thing. So if people, um, I was, the, the, the event I did in Tlangothlin the, the other day, uh, the, the uh, church warden I spoke to there, she said, look, there's no way that I'm going to be going up to the church at five o'clock on a dark, stormy night in winter uh, because it's just not safe. Um, and so it's open all the time. And, and if you tell us about that, then, you know, most of the time we're quite happy with that. Again, it's not a one size fits all. So if you do want to open the doors 24 hours a day because of the circumstances of where you are, the fact that it's remote or the fact that it's, um, uh, you know, uh, off the beaten track, then talk to us about that. I'd be more than happy to offer some advice on that. Time locks, though, can be problematic. First of all, <coughs> time locks are the ones that, <coughs> that, that, that open on a certain, at a certain time and close during a certain time during the day. <coughs> Excuse me a second. I have to slow the tea. So they often work on a, on a um, like an electromagnet. Uh, so you set the time when you want it to open and you set the time when you want it to close. We're not 
really keen on them because they are um, they're not as strong as a normal lock. They can be forced open quite easily. Um, <clears throat> but one of the big things is is this scenario. So I'm out on my on my bike and I'm riding around some of the lovely churches down on the Gower near where I live. And I stop off at the church. It's about five to five. It's getting towards the end of the day. My legs are getting tired. I think I'll just pop in here. So I've heard there's some lovely stained glass here. So I go into the church and I go to the front and I'm looking at the stained glass above the altar. And um, in the background, in the peace and the quiet of a Gower churchyard, I hear a whir and a click. Now that whir and a click is the time lock closing at five o'clock. Now, there's a chance I might be stuck there inside that building uh, with no phone signal, getting very cold and only with an energy drink, one of those horrible gel things stuck in the back of my shorts, ready for, ready for my journey home. Um, if it was someone who was a little bit older who panicked, um, then that wouldn't be good either. So we're not keen on, on time lots. Again, if you have a situation you think, well, that would be actually, that would be really helpful and talk to us and we'll have a conversation and we can offer some advice. The other thing about it is about key safes. We, we, we're not keen on key safes. Um, I know some people use them on, trip, on village halls, especially when you've got lots of people coming in and out, different groups and things. Um, again, if you, if you have that and you've got lots of people who have got keys, then um, there's some great guidance on our website about how to limit the number of keys and keep, keep everything safe. It's not that we don't trust people, but the, the more keys that are out there, the more chance of, of them getting dropped or lost or stolen. And therefore the building's very exposed, not just to say, not necessarily the church, but certainly church hall is there. Make things safe. That's part of the, that's part of the deal, isn't it? We talked about in our first session is, you know, making sure that things are kept safe. Um, so, you know, don't have big lumpy spiky bits of metal just near the entrance door. If you've got the, the doors open for people to come in, um, be sensible about things. If you know there's a hazard, make it clear that there's a hazard there, do, we'll do something about it. It's common sense at the end of the day. Next slide, please. So here's six things that, um, that you can think about, six steps to take when it comes to thinking about opening your church or how to, how to open your church safely. <clears throat> Step one, people. That, that picture on the right-hand side there <clears throat> is um, what we call human CCTV. So it's those people who, are <coughs> who are around, live around the church <coughs> and they may be parishioners, they may be attenders of your, of your church. Excuse me a second. Or it could be that they're just, just neighbours, just friendly neighbours. And they are great at keeping an eye on things. They really are. Um, they, um, they will often know somebody, they will often know the vicar or somebody else on the PCC. And if anything's out of the ordinary, they pick up the phone. Um, and so those inquisitive neighbors are great. Like I said, in some circumstances, like like I was saying, in the in the sort of um, in the in a in a say a market town situation where you might choose to open just on market day or on the weekends as on a saturday um then sometimes stewards or church sitters uh, uh can be helpful um it just provides that extra level of security but it also gives people an opportunity to to talk uh to the folk that come in um activities in the church i mentioned this before about the fact that you know if you've got people on site um you know doing maintenance cleaning cutting the grass in the churchyard um, you know, the music practices, that sort of thing, then that, that can really help in just making it obvious that there's someone in the building and that will hopefully deter any wrongdoing that's going on. Um, and again, for people who live near, near the church, you know, that daily routine of doing the school run or going for a run or uh, walking the dog, that kind of thing, just keeping an eye on things. So people can really help in, in, in the, um, in, in keeping the, the building safe when the, when the doors are open. Um, and the other thing as well is about main, main, maintaining visibility. So, so, you know, having a visible presence in the church. So the, for instance, that I often give at this point is, um, uh, it, it, like I said, we, it's, it's less of a problem now than it was. It's kind of increased a little bit recently, but uh, the, the theft of roof metal, lead especially uh, from the roof of churches. 
the roofs of churches. And um, the we've had a, a few instances where, like I say, this this whole thing about sort of inquisitive or, or, or caring neighbours, um, where a white van turns up, a few blokes in overalls get out, they got a clipboard, um, and they'll go up and they'll look very official, um, and then a ladder appears and they're up on the roof, um, and then you know they, they could be there for many hours stripping the lead off of roofs. If you've got people around, you can keep an eye on things. Then it just means that they're you know a quick phone call to the to the vicar or to a church warden saying. Are you expecting anybody up at the church today? No. Oh, there's a van with some men in, with overalls on. And you've then got an opportunity to, to do something about it, to call the police to do something about it. So that's the first step. People. Second step is, next slide, removing temptation. Already mentioned about this. So taking the expensive altar wear off of your, uh, off of the altar and, and, and uh, other things away. Uh, from from the church uh, inside the church itself what we're finding rather disturbingly is that the the brass eagle lecterns are being stolen at the moment um, for two particular markets the first one for some reason we don't know why uh, but central and south america seem to be very keen on these and they're they're being shipped across there um, to be sold on the black market over there uh, and secondly a bit more closer to home and a bit more sinister worryingly um, because of the eagle um, uh, depiction or image on, on, on these lecterns, um, a lot of the far-right neo-Nazi groups in, in uh, Eastern Europe and Central Europe are, 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 um, uh, are, are finding these things very, uh, very appealing and very attractive. So if you've got one, then think about what you could do with it. I mean, most of them are incredibly heavy, um, but you might want to think about uh, securing it in some way using uh, a, a chain or a, um, uh, or a uh, bolting it to the floor. If you need to move it around for different uh, configurations within the church, then there may be a, a other alternatives. Again, if you want some advice on that, then please let us know. Hide the value. So, you know, um, sometimes if a, if a, if a piece is, um, uh, it's highlighted because it's important, um, that can then highlight it to a, to, a, to a thief that its value might be increased. So again, just sort of be, be sensible about what you do as far as that's concerned. And, and we also say about um, making the target harder. So um, putting the more valuable things in the vestry, in a safe, behind closed doors, that kind of thing, just, it just makes things a, a lot more safe. Next slide, please. Deter. Now, this is quite an interesting one because um, sometimes I, I've been to quite a few. I'm from Gloucestershire, uh, up in the Cotswolds, and um, I know some of the lovely churches that are up there. And you, you pop in to, to, to those during the day, um, especially in the summer months, and um, you quite often hear that there's a there's a, a, a CD or a, a, an MP3 of, of, of choral music or, or organ music playing on a loop. Um, and it just means that it's a little bit more welcoming, but also gives the impression that there's someone there. Uh, also, by having the lights on as well. Um, that again, that's uh, that's that's something which is uh, just gives that impression of, of the, of the uh, uh, building by occupied. Putting notices up. This thing about this box, this this collection box is open daily. Again, that just might deter people from causing more damage. Um, and then. Um, the other thing to say is about smart water. I mentioned it the, the, during the, the first half presentation, but uh, smart water is that um, the marking solution you put on your roof lead. Um, you can use it for that, but you can also <clears throat> you can also use it for marking stuff within your uh, within the building as well. So things like you know your silverware, um, the, your lecterns, your 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 sort of expensive items that you've got or valuable items that you've got within your church. If you need more smart water liquid, then uh, get in contact with smart water. Tell them that you're an ecclesiastical insurance uh, customer. They will give you some very generous discounts. And normally they charge uh, £120 a year to be registered with smart water. Um, we have um, negotiated that so that if you're an ecclesiastical customer, you won't need to pay that. 
Okay, so that'll save a little bit uh, of money there as well. But I would say, please, 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 it's a condition of your policy that you have the, the, the warning sign up. If you need more signs um, uh, or you've lost one or it's got blown away in the storm, then again, just contact us and we can get arranged for something sent out to you. Okay, but please put that, put those up. Um, so next one, that's, so that we're talking about the deterrent and then reducing the arson risk. So again, um, don't put a can of petrol next to where the hymn books are. Um, you know, sort of just, I suppose, sensible things, you know, cans of petrol for the strimmer, put them somewhere, take them away from, from the church or, or put them somewhere out of the way. Um, <clears throat> mix in things that you can, you know, that, that, that form a, uh, a fire like matches or lighters and things like that, putting those next to large supplies of, of newspaper, cardboard, even, even candles, just separate the two so that you can actually, um, uh, uh, it, it just keeps keeps everything safe for you. Okay, uh, there's a thing there about automatic fire detection system. Most parish churches don't have that. Uh, some of the larger ones do. Um, again, if you're thinking about that, contact us and we can offer some advice on not what not just what to do, but also who to turn to as well. Okay, next slide, please. So about recovery. So this is all about. Um, Keep him a record of what you've got. Um, so taking photographs of everything. So taking photographs of, of the, uh, the things that you've got, taking photographs of stained glass, uh, taking photographs of uh, if you've got some you know, beautiful carving in your church, take photographs of it and, and keep those safe. Um, now with digital photographs, it's very easy. So keep, you know, keep a copy yourself, but also put, some, put, put a copy of it on the cloud, send it to somebody else in the parish to keep that safe as well. So if anything does happen, whether something gets stolen or damaged or catches fire or anything like that, you've got a record and you can give it to us and then we can then help you get it back to what it was uh, before. Especially true of things like stained glass. If you've got really good photographs of stained glass, it helps the, the maker uh, reproduce that. Um, uh, it makes it their, their job so much easier. Um, <clears throat> the... Uh, there is a there is this thing called immobilize. Uh, I've not used it myself, uh, but it's it's like a, a property register that you can use. And uh, often the dioceses will have their own rules about what should happen as far as um, registers and terriers, uh, uh, inventories and terriers as well. So again, uh, seek some advice from the diocese who might be able to help you with that. Um, if uh, just to make sure that you know you're doing all the things that they they would require you to do. Um, but you would not believe, having, having just moved house myself, um, sort of within the last month or so, um, we were finding things that we'd forgotten. We were in our house 15 years before we moved. And we were finding things that we just didn't even realise or remember that we had. Uh, and, and the same is true in church life as well. The stuff that you have, you kind of take it for granted. Uh, but if, you, um, if you've got good notes, good photographs, things written down, then again, that really does help if the worst happens and things get damaged or stolen. Next slide, please, Matt. Make it safe. So this is the last thing. Remember I said in the first uh, half of the presentation that there's that responsibility that you've got, that if you know there's a problem, if you know there's something that's not safe, if you know there's something that's, that's, uh, that needs to be fixed, that you do what you can to fix it or you limit it. And that's what risk assessments are all about. So you look at a situation, you say, what could go wrong here? How could people be injured? How could things be damaged? And then we say, well, right, if I can't eliminate those things, what do I do to make it safe? What's reasonable for me to do to make to keep that, uh, keep that situation safe? So like I said, our, our steps in our churches are often uneven uh, and, uh, uh, and um, not flat. Um, but we wouldn't have it any other way. But what might, so what's reasonable there? Well, it might be reasonable to put a handrail there to help people up and down. It might be reasonable to make, to, to put up a sign. It's that sort of thing that we're looking at, especially if the building's not occupied, you haven't got a steward there just directing people, then just a, 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 you know, a few signs up uh, to, to do that. It's again, the law says we've got to do what's reasonable, what's reasonably practicable, that's what it says. Um, so, uh, 
to eliminate those most, it says here about most injuries and accidents coming from slip strips and falls, to, to try and eliminate those as much as possible by making the environment safe. Review health and safety arrangements. I made, um, I made mention in the first half of the presentation about the, the, the tremendous amount of um, resources that are available on, on our website. Um, again, if you want me to come and help you with that and talk to you about that, I can. Um, and we've got a whole host of other people who can, who can help with those things. But like I say, when you're assessing risk, it's not, there's no real sort of mystery to doing risk assessments, but it's really just those, those three things there. Um, what harm might come to the visitor on the premises? Who might be coming in? What's already in place and what more needs to be done? Those are the sort of things that we need to be looking at. And then again, we've got loads of resources and, and uh, information there about carrying out fire risk assessments. Um, and again, I can do training on that, but also um, there's uh, templates and, uh, and guidance notes on our website as well. So that's your responsibility about keeping things safe. It means that when the people do come in, then you don't have to worry about those things. You don't have to worry about the fact that there is, um, you know, there are people coming into your building because you've thought through all those things. And you can't eliminate every risk, but you can do what you can to keep things and people safe. And the next slide, please. Oh, go back one. Nope, oh, other way. And again. Oh, no. Okay, so I think you need to go back about four or five, if that's okay. Sorry, this mouse is really sensitive. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, I know. Okay, one more. Uh, that one? There we go. That's the one. Brilliant. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So, um, so make it safe. This is the final step. We're making it safe. Uh, loan working. Now, this is again, it's just a bit of common sense, a bit of just a bit of thinking through something. Um, church life runs with the with the goodness of people's hearts and, and the, the people giving their time and giving their resources uh, to make things work. And and that's really true, um, even if it's something simple like, um, so, you know, Mrs. Evans from the village is going up on a Saturday afternoon to, um, to do the flowers for church the following day. Uh, she lives on her own, but she's got a really good neighbour. And so she, as she leaves the house to go up to the church, she knocks the neighbour's window, just popping up to the, to the church to do the flowers. Later that, after that evening, the uh, neighbour goes out to their garden, looks at Mrs Evans's house and sees that the light's not on in the kitchen, which is, it's always on. And she realises that maybe there's a problem. So she's, she, she's able to then go up to the church uh, and if, if, if Mrs Evans has taken a tumble and she she's needs a bit of help, then she can do, do that. Sometimes a loan working plan is as simple as making sure that someone knows that you're up at the church. It's, it's better, if you can, to send two people because they can help one another. And if anything does go wrong, the other, the other person can, um, can raise the alarm. It also gives you that sense of, of peace of mind as well, that, that actually you're not, you don't have to go up to the church, especially when it's dark, especially when the weather's bad uh, and you don't have to go up there on your own. The next thing then is about assessment of hazards and risks encountered. Again, taking into account the age and mobility of the people that are, that are, going, to be, are going to be there, you know, opening the doors, locking up, doing the work in the church. Um, we mentioned about the fact that the, one of the benefits of, of, of some of our churches is the fact that there's no phone signal, which means we don't get interrupted um, and we can have some peace and quiet for a period of time. But one of the disadvantages are they may not be a phone signal, so it might be difficult to raise the alarm. So again, it's just about thinking that through. So maybe two people are better because one can then go and raise the alarm. Um, when you're looking at sort of vulnerable adults and children, those who are elderly who have got additional needs and things like that, again, it's just thinking through that. Um, what can you do to make the welcome that you give? Um, what can you do to make it uh, even better? Um, sometimes churches will have um, displays or, or pop on those pop-up banners um, or even just sort of simple cards around the church with things of interest you know this stained glass window depicts this or this memorial is to so and so who lived in the village and was famous for doing this and you've got those around there so is there another way you can do that um there are all sorts of in ingenious things in the, probably the most amazing one i've heard of is um the use of those qr codes you know the little dotty square things that you see everywhere um <clears throat> 
and um there's a church uh, a few churches now have got those and they've got them next to stained glass windows because they've got particularly beautiful um, unique stained glass windows and what some very clever company has done is if you if you hold if you hold your phone up to the qr code and then hold your phone up to the window the window will come to life it is animated and the person in the window will tell you the story of the window don't ask me how it happens it's all mystic arts and, and deep strategy as far as i'm concerned but there are those things now you may not be at that kind of level but you might be able to do some boards that, that tell the story of the church you might want to tell the story of of, of easter or christmas uh, you might want to give the reasons why we why we remember on remembrance day and just by having those up um, it just means that when the visitors come they can see something different they can learn a little bit more about uh, about, about about the building about the community and about faith assessing the hazards as well it also includes non-legitimate businesses and unusual behavior so um i'll give you for instance from up in your part of the world and i had a conversation with somebody who was at a sort of town center church um and uh the the churchyard was used a lot it was kind of a cut through i think to to the shops um, and um there were people there who uh looked some of the local youths and others were would congregate there and, and there was some drug dealing and drug use and things like that um and so the the person i spoke to there was concerned about the fact that that some of the some of his church wardens and other volunteers were finding needles and other paraphernalia in in, in the in there so the advice in those sorts of circumstances would be very different from a from a very rural parish that maybe has one person passing there every day, or it might be near a, um, a, a bridal path or a cycle path or something like that. So like I say, it's not one size fits all. Um, and you've got to be mindful of that. Um, it may not be appropriate to open your doors uh, because of the circumstances that are there. Certainly to leave the doors open uh, with nobody there to, to, um, uh, to, 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 to supervise and keep an eye on things. So, so think about that, but also um, I mentioned again about sort of the slips, trips and falls, thinking of what the hazards are, thinking of what the um, uh, of what needs to be done to, to make that area of the, of the church safe. Um, the last little bit on there then is, is what's already in place, what more needs to be done. So I mentioned about if, you, if, if people are going up to the church, then, you know, two is better than one, if it's at all possible. Um, just thinking through that method of communicating things, checking in with people, um, the emergency code, that's another thing. Um, like I mentioned in, at the start of, of the, uh, the evening, I used to work for a, for a Christian charity. We used to run events all over the country and uh, they were open to the public. Um, and uh, so we would get all sorts of people coming in um, and we had a code. We would all, especially on venues that were, had lots of different levels. So like we used theatres and concert halls and things like that. Um, we all had headsets and radios and keep in contact with each other. And if we needed help, we would just press the button and say, can someone bring the, bring the red box to the foyer or wherever? It was the person that was there that was causing the problem or the disruption wouldn't know that that's what we've done, but it meant that other people in the team could get there. And maybe that's something that you could, you could think of um, uh, about how, how to keep people safe when they're in the building. Um, and the other thing is that the, you know to talk to your volunteers as well about about keeping themselves safe um it's a difficult conversation isn't it um because people are offering their time and their resources and and they're they're they're, they're offering themselves uh, as 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 volunteers to do to do a job and, and to do to do a, a, an amazing job um, but sometimes we need to have that conversation about about um uh about keeping safe um and um, if you do feel threatened, what should you do? Um, so again, we've got lots of guidance on that. I'm sure the diocese would have further guidance on that as well. Um, <clears throat> but again, it's it, when it comes to volunteers, it's it, again, it's making sure that the, the people that we're asking to do the job or the task in hand are, are, are able to do it. And that goes for... Um, I don't think we've got any Jeffs on the on the thing, so I'll, I'll say Jeff. So, so Jeff going in and and uh, you know replacing light bulbs at the top of a step ladder or winding the church clock. But Jeff's eighty-seven and he's not as he's not as agile as he used to be. Um, 
you don't want to discourage Jeff from doing anything in the church. Um, you want to encourage him and want to want to recognize the, the amazing work that he's done. But sometimes as part of your responsibility as, as, as church wardens and as, as clergy, you have to have that conversation that says, do you know what, Jeff, I get really worried about when, when you go up that, that ladder. Um, next time you do it, I'll come along with you or I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask somebody else to do that. But could you do this for me? And it's those sort of conversations. It's that part of that responsibility thing. So keeping people safe um, and, 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 and knowing what to do uh, if anything happens. Uh, uh, next slide, please. I've said this quite a few times over during the course of the uh, the evening. Uh, our website is a is a, a, a mine of information on, on all of these things. So, again, I'll send links in the email that I'll send through to you tomorrow. Um, but there's a whole load of stuff on there as well. So, anything you're thinking of doing, if you've got any questions, then please contact me. But also, our website is a great source of information. So please use it. Uh, it's all free to access. There's no there's no charge or passcodes or anything like that. It's all it's all public access. So just please dip in and, and, and enjoy the resources and use the enjoy the resources that are there. Uh, and uh, next slide, please. So we've gone through this. So the key messages are: please do it. If you feel that you want to either start opening your church or continue into opening your church, be confident in the fact that you are insured. Um, it's one of the few insurance policies that are around that doesn't have a clause that says that we'll only cover you if people break in or break out of your property. We don't have that clause. Use the resources that are available. We, there are a huge amount of stuff on there. Please use it. Review your security and safety. If you're thinking of doing this new or you're you're revisiting it, then just just take a step back and say, think, right, have, have we checked, have we looked at our policies and procedures recently? If not, dedicate some time to do it just to make sure they're all up to date. Again, lots of advice on our website. You can contact our risk management people and we'll help you with that. Um, revised procedures, like I said, maybe you've not thought about loan working before or, or having a having a procedure in place to make sure that you're, you're keeping people safe, people safe but, but please, uh, please do that. Joe, you wanted to ask a question. Yeah, now we're all arranged in mission areas rather than the legal responsibility being mm. with parishes. Yeah. With respect to policy and procedures, is it a mission area policy and procedure that we have to follow for certain things and our own health and safety for instance would be particular to our church how does that work sort of within uh, the think, system yeah i think i think with things like uh, health and safety policies you've got you've got those things that are sort of the, the general things that would apply to any building um so you know you've got that that sort of umbrella stuff but then you've got the the detail the nitty-gritty underneath it that may be you know, unique to St John's Church, and any might in at St Mary's Church down the road might be completely different. So I think there's probably a little bit of both. Um, I think it's a good idea. I, I, I was going to mention this next. Actually, is uh, we often advise uh, or, or recommend that you have um, uh, like a health and safety buddy. So it would be someone in a neighbouring parish who you you agree maybe once a year, maybe on a Saturday. We're not very prescriptive about these things, but you pick a day and you travel to each other's churches, okay? Not, not for a service, but just for a, to, to have a look around. And with a fresh pair of a purely objective eyes, you look around that building and you look for things that are, that, that, you know, that are, I don't know, things that are loose or wobbly or um, uneven or whatever. And it's not out of a sense of judgment or it's not out of a sense of anything other than wanting to be helpful. You then can report back I would recommend either in a coffee shop or a pub halfway between the two churches, you sit down and you go through that list together because you know what it's like. It's like being at home, you know, at home where the creaky floorboards are and the, and the, the door that doesn't open quite as, 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 as easily as the others. And you know about it and you just make allowances for it. And, and, and after a while, you just ignore it. You just, you know, it just becomes that thing that happens. And the, and the same can be true of churches as well. So when you're looking at, but things like you know doing risk assessments and things, it might it's sometimes useful to have someone who's coming in and they're purely looking at it from 
from that point of view for as a visitor rather than as a as a as a parishioner or a church official uh, so that's another thing that might be might be helpful but i think that <clears throat> it, it's going to depend on you mentioned about the you know mission areas and that sort of thing um it'd be worthwhile taking some advice from the from the diocese as well asking them what their view is on it because they may have a an assumption that the, the things are going on or they may have some rules about what they they feel needs to to, to happen um but i think that there's going to like i said there's going to be those things which are sort of applicable to all places and all of the all of the parishes and all of the churches that we that are in, in the mission area and then there's going to be those things that are very specific to to your or to any one particular to a particular parish so i think the answer is probably a little bit of both um but um if you do have someone who's got overall responsibility for things like health and safety and risk management within the, the ministry area again um, if that's not one of you on the call tonight, then please pass on my details to that person so that I can they can get in touch if there's anything that's needed. OK. Uh, so talks about revising procedures, recording the valuables and, and, and asking us to seek advice. Talk to people in the diocese as well. Can I have the last slide then, please. Uh, so right at the start, we had this slide which said, well, surely we're not insured if we leave the churches open. Well, yes, you are. It's not one size fits all, but in very, very broad terms, we are delighted if you open your doors for the reasons that we've said. Secondly, everything has to be locked away if it's open. Well, again, it's a sensible approach. It's that common sense that says, actually, we're going to put the very expensive, valuable things away, but we're not going to hide everything away because we still want it to look like a church. So we're going to put some plaster or wood stuff, uh, altar pieces up on the altar. Uh, is that sensible approach someone has to be on the premises all the time when it's open no they don't they may do and that may be appropriate for your circumstances but we don't demand it and it's very much for you to figure out whether that's appropriate for you and it's it's whether you want to do that and sometimes the, if i know that i think everybody on the call said that they're already open in their doors but but there's a um there, there's a um it, sometimes there's a there's a bit of a progression a bit of a uh, an, an evolution of these things so you might open a saturday afternoon you might have a couple of stewards there that, that take a turn on the rotor for a couple of hours and then that might develop and actually that's gone really well let's do a wednesday morning as well and then it gradually works and then and then before you know it the church is open and it's being used and is is you know some real life has been breathed back into it um then finally we're asking for trouble if we leave it open I guess for me, like I said at the start, this is all about helping churches tell their story. I have always loved stories. Um, I grew up with Jack and Ori on BBC in black and white, uh, where someone very good at reading stories would re read me a story for 15 minutes every day for five days. And I was taken away to all sorts of amazing places and, and heard about amazing situations and amazing stories and, and I've always, always loved stories. And whether the story you're telling is one of history, whether it's a story of the heritage that you have uh, and, and uh, the, the, the characters that have lived in your village or your town, or whether you're telling the story of faith, these are all really valuable stories that everyone needs to hear. And if we can help by saying to you, please open your doors, it's fine then that's great. As far as I'm concerned, that's a job well done. Jo, you had a question. Yeah, just something um, occurred to me that um, we've got our bell ringers are going to be ringing a full peal in August and we want to do something around the church at that time. And we <laughs> had thought about doing um, tower, you know, taking people up into the tower. Would we have to yep. take special insurance to do that? No. Um, <clears throat> again, it, it, it's one of those things that um, it's difficult to say this is what you need to do because your tower is going to be completely different from everybody else's tower. Um, so um, well, I can get some guidance sent out to you. Um, when I send the email around or when Pamela sends the email around tomorrow, if you want to reply to me and ask that specific question, I'll make sure that I send out that, that guidance for you. Um, we've got some just some really simple guidance and basic principles on, on how to do that safely. And it's, it's about, you know, making sure that those the tower tours are stewarded properly, that um, 
that you know all the sort of necessary warnings for people that have, that have sort of uh, struggle with mobility and and you know pregnant mothers and various other things um making sure that that's all catered for um and, and making sure that the numbers are kept low uh, it's age appropriate that's a, so there's lots of there's lots of things to think about but it's a great opportunity to again to get people in uh, into the building so um so yeah, in broad terms, we're, we're happy for, we're happy for people to do that, um, uh, but there are a few sort of guidelines that we give uh, for people to think about when they're when they're planning these things.